Thank you to all those young people who helped out with the very daunting task of talking on camera about such an abstract topic. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, well, that was a bit lame. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. My name's Kareth, for those of you who don't know me, and it's great to be here with you all today. Uh, some of you may know or remember that I was the chaplain at Tullua State High School for some years back in the distant mists of time when I was a bit younger. While I worked there, um, I sometimes used to wear this T-shirt that had these words on it. There is always hope. Have we got that? Great. And uh, this shirt sometimes provoked really different reactions from the people at the school. Uh, there was one particular teacher at the school who'd had a really, and I mean really, rough time in his personal life. And he did not like the words on this shirt at all. That is not true, he would say to me, pointing at the words on my shirt. That is false hope for these kids. Sometimes there is no hope, Kareth. Sometimes the world is just, insert your own word here. Then there were some young people in the school who'd been removed from their families by the Department of Child Safety because it was not safe for them to be there. And there were some young people in the school who lived in generational poverty, generational crime, generational unemployment. And to them, I think the words on this shirt seemed like a far-off oasis, glimpsed up ahead in the desert, shimmering invitingly and drawing them closer. Do you think that's really true? They'd say to me, pointing at the words on my shirt. Is there really any hope for someone like me? Can my life really be any better in the future? And then there were some teachers and students who really liked seeing this shirt for reasons that they couldn't quite explain. Oh, it makes me smile when I see that shirt, they'd say to me. It makes me feel better about my day. Now, provoking people was not my intention when I purchased this T-shirt. <laughs> Encouraging people was. But provoke it did. And the idea of permanent, eternal, never-fading hope provoked different reactions from different people. To some people, hope is dangerous. To others, it's not real, it's just imaginary. To some people, hope is a beacon that leads them on. To others, eh, it's just a nice idea, but it doesn't have any substance. So what do you think hope is? What does hope mean? Well, we've heard some great insights from some of our children and young people, and now it's your turn. I'd like you to take some time with your family or with the people around you and talk about this and try and come up with a definition of hope. And then we might share some. So off you go.
All right, have we got some volunteers who would like to share? Oh, here's a hand. What they think hope is. Yeah, um, hope that I will get down to New South Wales for Christmas this year. And I'm, I'm hoping that. You're hoping. I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a good thing to hope for. If you... Oh, and hope you get back too, as Kathy points out. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a one way trip. We hope it's not a, a one way trip. Who else would like to share what they think hope is? Samuel, are you putting your hand up? No. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think so. We've got a hand over here. I think hope is the expectation that something might or will happen without any evidence to, to show that it will. And, yeah, the positive expectation that it will. Thank you. We think that hope is a peaceful feeling that things are just going to work out. Great. Some great ideas. I see a hand right over the other side. Is there anyone else here before I walk away? Oh, Mrs. Rogie. Believe, faith and trust. Okay. Great. Oh, here's another one. I am coming. I am coming. When we talk about hope, my hope in Jesus is certain. So it's a certain thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, where was that hand over here? Get my steps up today. What do you think hope is? Hmm. Well, hope is, hope can be classified as many different type of things but one but one thing is it's it's a blueprint that can be expanded upon mm -hmm. and okay I'm I'm my I'm trying to think of what I was going to say but I I please don't put me mind okay, so. um Hope. Um, mm. Did you want to say what your mum said? I wasn't done. Okay, <laughs> keep going. Hope is the blueprint for the manifestation of faith, and and it's a sense that everything will work out in the end and it's the expectation that no matter what happens it will be good yeah great fantastic was there were there any other hands over yeah. i worked with a man once who used to say things are never so bad they can't get worse. <laughs> if you've read the, Ro the Lord of the Rings, you will have noticed that there is a saying, for every silver lining, there is a dark cloud, which is an entirely negative view of life. The hope that we like to think about is the belief and the expectation that the circumstances we are in will improve. Thank you. No other hands that I've missed? Okay. Thank you for those contributions. It's not easy to come up with a definition of something like hope that can be so broad. Well, you know, I think our world tends to define hope as a wish or maybe a casual desire for something, like I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Uh, I hope my team wins the game tonight, whichever team that might be for you. Uh, I hope we can go overseas on a holiday next year. Now, clearly, we have little to no control over any of those things. 
what we hope for may or may not happen. The Bible talks about hope differently, though. According to the Bible, hope is a joyful and confident expectation and assurance about the future that's based on God's promises, God's character, and God's faithfulness. So this hope is not mere optimism. It's not positive attitudes. It's not a positive mindset. It's not a glass half full worldview. It's not wishful thinking. It's a joyful and unshakable confidence that God is working in and through his children to carry out his plans. So hope is one of God's gifts to us. Now, children, young people, I have a challenge for you today during the sermon. Can you draw a picture of hope? What does hope look like? When you think of hope, what pictures do you get in your head? That's your challenge. Of course, if there are any young at heart grown-ups here today who would also like to participate, feel free. There are pens and blank paper down on the back table. And later on in the sermon, I'm going to ask you to bring your hope pictures up here to the stage, and we will have a whole gallery of hope for the church to see and be encouraged by. So, hope is one of God's gifts to us. But hope and hoping can be hard sometimes. Which brings us to our Bible reading today, which is the first section of the book of Habakkuk. Now, I personally rate this as one of the most creative names I've ever heard, Habakkuk. I'm not hearing it uh, out and about in the community these days. If we've got any expectant mothers here today, you might like to consider adding that to your list. I think it's catchy, uh, rhymes with some things. We're going to look at the first section of Habakkuk. And this great name, because it is a great name, it means embrace or wrestler's hold. And this man, Habakkuk, certainly wrestled with God on some pretty big issues as he tried to keep hoping, even when hoping was hard. So this book was written around about 610 BC, Unhelpfully, it doesn't have one of those things inside the front cover with the publisher and the date and the address. So we think around about 610 BC, possibly when a man named Jehoiakim was king of Judah. And the Bible tells us that he was a very wicked king. He'd actually been put in power by the Egyptians, not even his own people. So he would do just about anything to hold on to that power. And Judah wasn't doing so great either. As a society, they just about abolished God and evil and injustice and selfishness were rampant everywhere. So in this time, in this place, Habakkuk, as a man of God, was angry. And he was scared for the future of his country. And he took his confusion and his pain to God in prayer. And this is what he said. We're going to read from Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. 
So the law is paralysed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. This is God's reply. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all of their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings, they scoff. And at rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Habakkuk is running out of hope for the future of his people and his country. And so he cries out to God. And his prayer is real and it's honest and it's from the heart. He totally acknowledges that Judah deserves God's judgment. He acknowledges the wickedness that's all around him. But why is God being silent? Why is he tolerating this evil? Habakkuk longs for spiritual revival for his nation and for his people. So why is God not providing this? And God answers Habakkuk. And I think we can say his answer was not what Habakkuk expected or wanted. God does not say that he will step in and bring revival. God does not say that he will stop the injustice and the oppression and the violence in Judah. No, God tells Habakkuk that things are going to get worse that national disaster is coming. He tells him that the mighty Babylonian army, otherwise known as the Chaldeans, huge army, ruthless, well-armed, well-trained, on a roll across the Middle East, will come to Judah, will destroy Judah, will take its people away as captives, that their attack will be fast and brutal. This is not the response Habakkuk was hoping for. In fact, I think it could be said that God's response to his heartfelt plea seems to squash any hope Habakkuk might have had. That Judah would return to following God or that God would rescue the people from their sin. Perhaps you have been in the place where Habakkuk was, where hoping was hard. Perhaps hope's been hard for you at a time in the past, or maybe hope is hard today. Perhaps you have brought desperate, heartfelt pleas to God about a situation in your life or in our world and he has been silent. How long are you going to let this go on, God? Why won't you do something? Do you even care? You are not alone. God is sometimes silent. 
and his silences have tested Christians for centuries. Maybe you've been frustrated with God or even furious at God. Are you angry with God because it seems that he has let you down? Or because it seems that he has not kept his promises? How does God watch all the evil and the brokenness and the injustice in our world and do nothing to make people keep his laws? Why is God not intervening in my situation to bring reconciliation or restoration or healing? How much longer can I go on hoping? My hope is running out. Where in your life is it hard to have hope today? Now, we will hear more of Habakkuk's conversations with God over the coming weeks and see if his hope is restored. But for today, we're going to stay in the place where Habakkuk was. We're going to stay in the place where hoping is hard. And look to God's word for some encouragement about hope. And the first piece of encouragement from God's word is this, is that hope is a bit like a muscle that only grows when we stretch it and use it to its maximum. See, hope has real meaning and real value often when things are hopeless. When life's going well, as long as things are looking up, hope can remain a nice idea or an abstract concept. It remains a muscle untested, unstretched, unknown. It is often only when things fall apart, when hope is hard, that hope can become a real, present, tangible strength. And Paul writes about this process of hope stretching in his letter to the Romans. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's when we really need hope that we find out if we have any and what its capacity is. Now that's not to say, and Paul is not saying, that suffering and crises of faith don't hurt. They do. But it is out of times of suffering that hope can grow stronger. How can hope grow stronger, though, at these times, instead of just withering away? Well, oddly enough, earwigs come to mind. I know, that's odd. The Scripture Union writer Jennifer Rees Larkham shares this analogy. Look at them, attractive things, aren't they? As earwigs develop to maturity, they go through several cycles of molting off their hard outer shells and growing new, larger shells. And it is only, only in the brief period between shedding one hard shell and forming a new, bigger one that they can grow physically in size. So these gaps between shells provide chances for physical growth spurts, but they also leave their soft, unprotected bodies vulnerable to predators. And maybe the growth of our hope in God is a bit like this. For many of us, I don't think our development of our maturity in Christ is a lovely gradual process. 
but smooth and steady, a cycle of continuous improvement with no interruptions and no stops and starts and no backward steps. Maybe that's just me. I think for many of us, the growth of our maturity in Christ is more like a series of growth spurts, like earwigs have. Sometimes, sometimes for a long time, we can be safely cased in our cosy shells when life is smooth sailing and then when our shells are taken away through pain or tragedy or suffering, our hope may feel threatened. We can think that our hope is gone, that it's too hard to hold on to hope at a time like this. But if we can survive this vulnerable time, this gap between our shells, if we can endure, as Paul encourages us to, we can discover a new, bigger hope. A hope that is bigger than it once was, stronger than it once was, more resilient than it once was. A hope that will not disappoint. But what we do with our hope in this gap time is key. Can we be like Habakkuk and keep pressing into God, keep wrestling with God, even when we are consumed by doubts, even when his answers to our prayers are not the ones we want, even when it seems that he does not answer us at all? In the gap between shells, our hope muscle can be really stretched and can grow stronger if we can keep on trusting the God who holds us in the palm of his hand. Habakkuk's second piece of encouragement for us today is that while the situation in front of us may be hopeless, while the relationship breakdown, the health issues, the unresolved pain may be hopeless, God himself remains our hope. And we must ensure that our hope is in him and not in a particular outcome to our situation. King David wrote these words. If I can have that next slide, Jacob, this doesn't seem to be working. Thanks, mate. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Habakkuk had to learn that if he placed his hope in the people of Judah deciding to turn back to God, or in the Babylonian army deciding, oh, I don't think we'll conquer Judah after all, he would be disappointed. He had to learn that while completely bewildered and angry with God's answers to his prayers, that God was still worthy of his trust and his hope. Sometimes we may want very specific answers from God to our prayers. But instead of giving us those answers immediately, God may want us to trust him more in the waiting or to know that he will not let us down. When things go wrong, it's very tempting to blame God. Habakkuk reminds us that God is always worthy of our hope and our trust, even when our circumstances are very hard. But... Do we put our hope in God in expectation of blessing? Rather than putting our hope in God simply because he is God? Do we put our hope in specific outcomes to our problems that we have decided are the best outcomes? Do we put our hope in things going a certain way, the way that suits us best? Is our hope in the future rather than in the God who holds us in the present? 
I think we have to learn to distinguish between hope in preferred scenarios and hope in God himself. God asks us to cling to him always, but especially when hope is hard, not to cling to what we can get from him. In the gaps between shells, when our hope muscle is stretched more than we thought it could ever endure, we may need to live with God's apparent absence or silence while knowing the truth that his light is still with us but that it is obscured by our circumstances right now. Unlike Habakkuk, though, we live this side of the cross of Jesus. So how does that affect our hope in God? Well, God's word simply tells us that Jesus is our hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans 8.28, a very familiar verse, assures us that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So this means that regardless of our circumstances and how hopeless they may be, God is still working for our good in all things, including those circumstances. He's not doing this only sometimes when life's easy and things are going well. Paul tells us here that in all things, all times, God is working for our good. His unmerited favour does not stop because he has called you his own child. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Perhaps the best thing we can do when we are frustrated, when hope is hard, when God seems silent, is to keep the lines of communication open, is to keep praying and keep hoping. Now, if you've finished your hope picture, feel free to come up and put it on the stage. If you haven't, keep beavering away. My prayer for us all today, no matter where we are on our journey with God, no matter how hard or easy hope is today, is this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound with hope. Where is hoping hard in your life right now? What situation or problem do you want to bring to God? What are you wrestling with God about? Where is our hope? Is it in God who loves us? And knows our every thought, who will never leave us, who will never forsake us, who knows the future and the past, who is working all things for our good. Are you between shells today? We can ask the God of hope to fill us with all joy and peace. So that in the Holy Spirit's power, we overflow with hope. Let's pray that for ourselves, but let's also pray that for our brothers and sisters who today are in the place where hope is hard. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes it's hard to keep hoping. Sometimes it feels as though our hope is running out. For those people here today, Lord, and for those people in difficult, extreme situations around our world, 
who are struggling today to hold on to hope. I pray that you would fill them with your joy and your peace, that their hope would again overflow. Help us all to ensure that our hope is in you. Give us that unshakable confidence that you are working in our world, working in our lives in ways we may not see, in ways we may not understand, in ways we may not recognise. But today we reaffirm, Lord, that you are the only one worthy of our hope and we place our hope in you. Amen.